the gospels are important the life of jesus is important because in jesus you see dominion dominion over the sea the wind and the wave and the tree and the mountain and everything dominion he shows what man has man has dominion this would be a good point a good a good uh, place to insert for jesus i stand i stand in all of you I stand I stand in of you Holy God to whom all praise is due I stand in of you You are beautiful You are beautiful beyond description tomorrow last forwards to wonderful comprehension like nothing else in all so who can grasp your infinite wisdom who can fathom the depths of your love you are beautiful beyond description majesty and throne above Pastor Sam P. Chaladurai speaks at the Zion AG Church in Coimbatore on the 22nd, 23rd and 24th of February. The meetings will be held in the morning and evening on all three days. For more details, please contact the numbers on your screen. We hope to see you there. When I looked at the fig tree and said, let no one eat fruit of you hereafter, I believed at that moment that whatever I said will come to pass. But you didn't believe that. See, your faith is not the kind of biblical faith that I have, he says. Jesus is simply saying, there is a difference between the way you believe and the way I believe. I'm not astonished at what has happened. You are astonished. I'm not astonished because I spoke and the moment I spoke, I considered it done. Now, this has implication all the way to verse 25 and so on. You know, and I will show that. This is linked to the whole passage, you know. So he says, have faith of God. That means have my kind of faith, the kind of faith that you see me show you. And then goes on to explain how this faith works. What is the difference between Peter's faith and Jesus' faith? Peter believed after seeing Jesus believed when he spoke. Actually, the truth is this. If you can see, you can't believe. Believing and seeing don't go together. That is why the biblical definition of faith found in Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. 
Faith has to do with the unseen. If you can see it, you don't have to have faith. Suppose you came in here today and didn't find me here today. and You brought your friend to meet me or something like that. And you said, come, we'll meet Pastor Sam or something. <laughs> and you came here and you didn't find me here. You tell your friend, don't worry, he's here. I know he's here. Believe me. Right? See, that makes sense, right? You're saying to your friend, believe me, he's here. He'll be here. He's out there somewhere. He'll come in here and he's going to preach. Believe me. Now, suppose I come in. Would you look at your friend and say, believe me, he's here? That doesn't make any sense because I'm here. You can see me that I'm there. When you can see, you can't believe. It is not possible to believe what you see because you don't have to believe what you see. You have to believe only when you can't see. Believing has to do with things not seen. Hello? Are you with me? Or have you, have you gone home? <laughs> All right? That's the way it works. So Jesus is saying, your faith is not faith at all. What you, are, what you are showing, Peter, is not faith at all. What I am showing is what faith is. Faith believes the moment the word is spoken, it's done. See, that's why I brought in last week's sermon and took five minutes to remind you of that. The word and faith as connection. Faith believes that when it spoke... Already the work is done. The tree looked cursed the next day, but the root got cursed the moment he spoke it. For it to show up outside, it took 24 hours. Right? So just because you didn't see it, it didn't mean that it happened. It didn't happen. It happened, but you can see it only 24 hours later. All right? So... Now, a lot of people still have a problem with Jesus cursing the fig tree. Say, my God, you know, Jesus, the good Lord, how can he curse a fig tree? You know, it's so wrong. Only if he had cursed the temple, then you'll find, you can justify this cursing. Otherwise, this cursing is so out of character with what Jesus would do. Let's deal with that. Now, I say to you, he cursed the fig tree to teach us a lesson about faith. Now, if he taught the faith lesson only by using the positive utterances, then you will end up believing that if you spoke positively, if you said positive words, it will come to pass. But you will not believe that if you spoke negative words, it will come to pass. The problem with human beings in the fallen world, with their fallen nature, is this that they're constantly speaking negative words, and that is what is killing them. That is what is killing them. You just find how, you just find in the world how the devil has inserted negative talk into people, infused it, without even knowing they will speak about it. You know, in some English-speaking places, you will find the, certain expressions, very, you know, they, they'll say, I'm tickled to death. <laughs> I can understand how you're tickled. You know, one person was saying how that person had a terrible problem in the stomach, something was going on, and finally went to the doctor, and they found out, and she got operated, and you know, she's home, and she's just tickled to death. I felt like saying, wonderful, she got healed, but died? Died? They use that word just like that. So, you know, I, you may say, well, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't matter and all that. Yeah, maybe so. But the thing is, the truth is our language is so infused with death, lifelessness, darkness, failure, emptiness. Since the fall of man, human language has become infused with things that pull us down and drag us down, my friend, on the whole. I'm not just talking about one person just saying tickle to death. I'm talking about some people always talking death, always talking darkness, always talking failure, always talking, you know, things that are negative. So, one of the things in faith is, if you want to operate, live by faith, 
a person who wants to successfully live by faith and operate in faith in their life has to understand the power of their own words we all christians understand the power of god's word the problem with christians is we don't understand the power of our own words yet the bible speaks so much about the power of our own words it says consider the big ship though it is so big it is driven by a small rudder it's about the tongue the tongue is a tree of life it says joy comes by the word of mouth the bible says now you can see why some people don't have joy at all you know very difficult for them you know if it comes from the word of your mouth then the words must be words that will produce joy my friend really otherwise it can't you just take you just take the bible and find out what all it says about the tongue and the power of the tongue you'll be amazed you know you'll be astonished at the whole thing james chapter 3 particularly in the new testament this just you can't outbeat it totally about the tongue you know so jesus is trying to teach faith in a holistic manner he has to emphasize the negative as well as the positive without emphasizing you see all the teachers do it you know if i have to tell you what something is suppose i say i'm going to teach about what sin is i'll probably start with what sin is not and then go to what sin is because you have to show the negative and then positive it helps you know to look at both sides so jesus is showing what faith is and how faith works he's got to show the negative and the positive it works in the negative as well as the positive way because we are cursing all the time it has become part of our nature it is part of our behavior in the fallen world it has this thing has been so infused into our character and to, into our language so jesus says if you want to live by faith you know learn to speak only what god says jesus said i speak only what my father speaks and uh, i do only what the father says that's why he was so powerful he says learn that so he was trying to show the negative and cursing one tree is not going to cause big damage sorry dear tree lovers there are people out there in the world that say have you hugged your tree today you know that kind of thing uh, but but you know i love trees also i wouldn't want to cut up any tree at all and i wouldn't want to curse a tree really you know and if you did cut up one thing you know you would want to plant 10 more to replace that you know which will be good i believe all that but a tree is a tree you can sacrifice one tree to teach big teaching on faith that's the whole point there jesus thank god he cursed the fig tree but otherwise i'd be cursing every day and something will be dying every day in my life and then only i'll find out my god my words are killing this stuff you know some people are looking at me saying you have to do not curse brother read james chapter 3 i think verse 10 it says out of the same mouth comes cursing and blessing how is it is it how do christians have out of the same mouth blessing and cursing coming sometimes it's cursing sometimes it's blessing why because people don't know that cursing will work <laughs> we believe blessing will work right that's why even irreligious people that not even religious they drop their wife in church in india go out and take care of their business come back to pick up the wife after the sermon is over and they find the preacher getting up there to give the benediction and they open the door and stick their head in you know <laughs> just to get the benediction good words on their head because they believe in the blessing blessing is pronouncing blessing they want to get it you know we believe in blessing we just don't believe in cursing we believe blessing we believe we believe that somebody will just come and bless our house bless our car bless our business bless our everything we believe blessing but every day we are cursing the business every day we are cursing the salary every day we are cursing the work of our hands we don't think it's cursing at all some people say where did i curse well when you bring the salary home and you say here i don't know how long it will come i don't know i don't see how six of us can eat out of this for many days now you tell me what difference there is between saying see how long six people can eat out of this 
I don't think it's enough at all. And saying, let no one eat fruit of you hereafter. Think deeply now. Plus, minus, add, deduct, multiply. <laughs> Do your mathematics. I will tell you there is nothing different. <laughs> nothing much different. Few words here and there. It's the same thing. Translates basically into the same thing. Monday morning you get up and say, I hate this work. I hate to look at that boss of mine, that stupid face. <laughs> and then soon you don't have that work. <laughs> no wonder you hated it. You cursed it. It became cursed, dried, withered away. You see? See, we don't look at these things as cursing. That is why I believe Jesus said, let's sacrifice one tree today. So forever this will be preached, not only in AFT in Chennai, but all over the world, that this fig tree that was cursed will be put up before people and the lesson will be preached that when you open your mouth and speak, remember what you say is what you will get. That's the whole lesson. That's what it amounts to, basically. So I say to you, this is not about the temple. How can this be about the temple? If it was about the temple, he would have said, when he said the fig tree is cursed, he said, remember, that's what is going to happen to the temple. But let's listen to the next verse, 23. See, I'm quoting verses. Don't think I'm just saying something. This is Sam's philosophy, you know. <laughs> Have faith of God is verse 22. Now verse 23. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he saith will come to pass, he shall have whatever he says. Now take it apart quickly. Whosoever. Now what does this whosoever has to do with the temple cursing? If Jesus is predicting the cursing of the temple and doing away with the temple, the, how the temple will be cursed and completely done away with, which, which is what happened, you know, later on in just a few years. If Jesus was predicting that, fine. If you say that's what it means, I'm ready to accept it. But what does verse 23 have to do with that? And what does verse 22 has to do with that? What does fig tree cursing has to do with verse 23? Because after cursing, after Peter said, the tree you cursed has withered away, in response, Jesus says, have faith in God. And that response continues by saying, not only have faith in God, in other words, have my kind of faith. And then he explains his kind of faith. He says, whoever says to this mountain, be thou removed. In other words, he says, any man made in the image and likeness of God, Remember when God made man, the Bible says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion. Actually, their translation must go, they say, so that they may have dominion. Verse 26, be fruitful, multiply, replenish. All that is done away with in verse 26. Straight away goes to dominion, showing the, showing the importance of the idea of dominion for man. Let's make man in our image and likeness. Let them have dominion or so that they may have dominion. He has made everything. He wants somebody to have dominion over everything. That's why God made man. It's a plain statement of the Bible. And Jesus is simply teaching on the basis of that. Whoever says to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast. See, in the fallen world, we could never comprehend that man was made indeed like that. We just can't believe that you know, man was given dominion. We just don't understand dominion because we have never seen dominion. But that's why the Gospels are important. The life of Jesus is important because in Jesus you see dominion. Dominion over the sea, the wind and the wave and the tree and the mountain and everything. Dominion. He shows what man has. Man has dominion. This would be a good point, a good, a good uh, place to insert for Jesus. Look, Peter, I've cursed the fig tree, disciples, listen. And it got cursed. This is really about the temple. Don't ever try to go and practice this on other things. It won't work for you. He could have made that point. 
I think I've said, I've given this example before. We used to have a, uh, one of those uh, uh, soft drinks advertisements in India. They make good advertisements now. For one of these soft drinks, you know, a truckload of soft drinks are going, bottles are going. One guy will jump into it, take a, open a bottle and drink out of it, and another guy from the car, he'll be saying, give me one, and he'll just throw another one to the guy. And it's all happening while going at about 80, 90 miles an hour speed, you know. And that guy catch a, catches a hold of it, and he drinks it, and he throws it to another guy on a bike or something like that. You know, I forget the exact sequence. But anyway, there's all kinds of circus in just about 30 seconds, you know. And that guy also drinks. And while the whole thing is going on, there is a small line underneath. It says, please do not try it at home. This is done by stunt people, cinema stunt people, experts. Because they know that some fool is going to take this up and say, I'll take this car and I'll throw it from here to your bike. You catch it. We will go and put on a road show, you know, <laughs> and kill a few people on the way, you know. So please don't do it at home because this is done by stunt specialists. Now, Jesus should have said, this is the Son of God, man. This works for me, not for you. I'm cursing the temple, not the fig tree. Don't try it on anything. He could have said that. In fact, he says exactly the opposite. He says, not just this tree. Whoever will say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And shall not doubt in his heart, but believes that whatever he says will come to pass. He shall have whatever he says. Amen. Very difficult to understand for us who live in fallen world. We've settled for a less than a share of our own. <laughs> we have settled for, well, it's all right if I'm dominated. If it's all right, if I don't have any power. After all, in this society, we don't, we'll wait till we get to heaven, you know. And the church also tells us, wait till you get to heaven. You'll be walking on gold and, you know, everything will be under your feet and all that business, you know. And we have decided nothing works here for us. We just be as we are. That's why it's, this teaching is difficult. That's why they avoid this also. You go read anywhere where they're writing about Mark eleven twenty three. any commentary, anything, you know, you read. 23, when they come, they will gloss over it. Just you, you know that these very highly qualified people simply don't want to deal with it because they have to answer these things. So they'll never explain whosoever. Eh? This mountain they will explain. They say in Jerusalem there was a Mount of Olive. There's only one thing they'll say. But they will never say anything else. They will never explain whosoever. Then they will say, they will never say anything about, do not doubt in your heart, but believe. See, this is all about individual faith. See, even those that believe that this is about faith, but this is about the gift of faith, a very special kind of faith, they're making a mistake. Because if it's about the gift of faith, I believe in the spiritual gifts and the gift of faith and all of that. But this is not about the gift of faith. If it was about the gift of faith, it will be only for certain people at a certain particular time to do a particular task. A gift is given. But this is talking about, this is for, uh, this is for everybody. This has universal application, it looks like. You know, he says, whoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. He will have whatever he says. So this is not about the gift of faith also. So they will not deal with not only whoever, or whosoever, they will also not deal with, um, shall not doubt, but believe. This is about an individual not doubting and believing. What does that have to do with the temple? If he wants to curse, let him curse the temple. Why should he say, don't doubt, but believe? Why? It has nothing to do with me. You're cursing the temple, you curse it. It has nothing to do, but this verse clearly shows that it's not that at all. Shall not doubt, but believe that those things that he saith will come to pass. Another thing they miss here is the word say, saith, saith comes three times. Whosoever shall say, one, to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believes that whatever he saith, number two, shall come to pass. He shall have whatever he 
says. Says is mentioned three times in one verse. When you have something mentioned that many times in one verse, you better check it out because that's, that's very important there, you know. What is it all about? See, that's why Jesus cursed the fig tree. He's saying, whatever you say, you're going to have. I'll show you. Even if you curse the fig tree, you'll have it. If you speak curse words, you will have it. He says, whatever he says, he will have. So this is about an individual's faith, a faith that every believer can use. This is about the law of faith, which is applicable to anybody and everybody as a believer. the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. Oh, magnify the Lord, for He is worthy to be Magnify Him. Oh, magnify the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. to be praised. Oh, stand now. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Oh, stand now. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Oh, magnify the Lord. Rock of my salvation, Hosanna, 